Hello. Hi. Welcome to Drinking the Kool-Aid. Welcome. I'm Megan. I'm Hannah. And today we have a very special guest. <laughs> uh, my friend Al is here with us. So. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> so that's Al. <laughs> Uh, he really wanted to join us today. He's excited because we are going to be covering the Montana child murderer, also known as the cannibal child killer. I'm sorry. Maybe you shouldn't have said he's excited because we're oh. talking about that. <laughs> Was that bad wording? I mean, I'm thinking it might have been just a little bit. How would you like me to phrase that? Um, He's excited to be here and we are talking about... There you go. Oh. See? Okay, yeah, let's go with that. All right, so. <laughs> Are we ready? We're ready. True story. Did you know apparently people taste like chicken? Oh my god. <laughs> this has to be known when you're talking about cannibalism. Um, well, there's that interesting tidbit. We're only like a minute in <laughs> and we're already regretting this. <laughs> I did say he was our very special guest. You did emphasize that. Uh huh. <laughs> okay, so this is one of the worst stories about someone who repeatedly slipped through the cracks of the justice system. No, you know I hate those. I know. Like, he could have been caught so many times. Wonderful. Nathaniel Bar Jonah was born David Paul Brown in Worcester, Massachusetts on February 15th, 1957. And he was the youngest of four children. At a very young age, he started showing signs of pretty abnormal behavior. In 1964, Nathaniel received a Ouija board for his seventh birthday. Not a Ouija board! Uh-huh. No! Right. And isn't that kind of young? I just don't like Ouija boards in general, and I think that's incredibly young for one. So yes. Okay. You're never too young for a Ouija board. <laughs> of course. Thanks, Al. Yeah. <laughs> he promised a five-year-old neighbor that she could come over and try out the Ouija board with him. The kids went to the basement and he tried to strangle the girl. Luckily, Nathaniel's mother did hear the screams and she ran down the stairs and forced him to stop, but she never pursued help for her child after this incident. Boy, that went from zero to a hundred real quick. Right. Um, if your child strangles somebody else, I think we should look into that further. Please. Just throwing it out. In 1970, Nathaniel told a six-year-old boy that they could go sledding. He brought the child to a secluded area and then sexually assaulted him. A few years later, he attempted to lure two boys to a cemetery to kill them. What? Okay. The fuck? He actually cut out letters and words from a magazine, composed a note, and then offered the boys $20 and a surprise. Also, I did forget. I did forget. It wasn't chicken people taste like. It's pork. It's definitely pork. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> we really needed that. <laughs> One of the boys had a really bad feeling and was able to convince the other boy that they should leave. The mother of both boys decided that she was not going to press charges because she wanted Nathaniel to receive psychiatric help instead of going through the criminal justice system. In 1975, when Nathaniel was 17, he walked up to an 18 year old boy named Richard O'Connor who was on his way to school, and he told him he was a police officer. He was able to get the boy in his car, sexually assaulted him, and then attempted to strangle him. A neighbor happened to look out their window and see the abduction and called the police. Nathaniel was arrested, but he only received a year of probation. Okay, that's already insane considering all the things that happened with, like, the kids and everything. I know. Like, it's it's very clearly a problem. But it wasn't being reported at this point. I, oh, my God. You know? Because everyone was trying to save his ass. Next, he abducted a nine-year-old girl named Mary Patrone. Nathaniel drove to Hartford, Connecticut just days after he graduated high school. 
He impersonated an officer and abducted the young girl. She was assaulted and she did put up quite a struggle. Nathaniel threw the girl in his car and a witness took down the license plate and he was arrested. And the probation officer was never notified, so he wasn't charged. What? Yeah. All right, I'm starting to see your point already. Okay. In May of 1976, he was released from probation and received a letter thanking him for his cooperation. Yeah. What? Yeah, because he was being such a good boy. Uh, oh my god. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Whoa. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, dude, it's bonkers. The cops in this place also suck. In September 1977, he abducted two boys from a movie theater after claiming to be a police officer or an undercover FBI agent, depending on the articles that you're reading. He told the boys they were under arrest, handcuffed them, brought them to a secluded area, and sexually assaulted them. Nathaniel strangled one of the boys by sitting on him, and at this time, he weighed about 375 pounds, and he put the other victim in the trunk of his car. The boy that he strangled ended up surviving the attack and was able to go get help. Fuck yes. Right? The police found Nathaniel with the other victim in his trunk. He was charged with attempted murder and was only sentenced to 18 to 20 years in prison. When Nathaniel was serving his time, he did start seeing a psychiatrist. He began describing fantasies about murdering, dissecting, and eating children. Oh god, I hate this. I hate this. Yeah, you're not gonna like where it goes. It sounds like Hollywood. Oh my gosh. (laughs) The therapist said that his violent fantasies were Nathaniel's main source of sexual stimulation. The psychiatrist recommended that he be moved to a mental hospital. It was during this time that he changed his name to Nathaniel Benjamin Levi Bar Jonah. He told Wait, his, what? Yeah. What is the name? <laughs> <laughs> Do not make me say that again. <laughs> that was so long. <laughs> Well, he told his friends and family that he did this because he wanted to know what it was like to be discriminated against as a Jew. And I don't like the way that sounds, but that's his words, not mine. I was going to say, well, okay. Yeah. So that's why he changed his name, apparently. Okay. In 1991, a judge looked over the psychiatric evaluations and concluded that he was not a dangerous threat, and he was released on probation. Not a dangerous threat? Yeah, it was actually determined that the state had not met the burden of proof to determine that he was dangerous. He's quite literally saying that he wants to eat people. And apparently that's okay? I'm not sure. Nathaniel moved to Montana to live with his mother, but he still had to continue getting psychiatric help. He wrote a letter to a newspaper and said, quote, I've seen God take a hopeless situation like when all avenues were closed. It seemed I'd never, ever be released. Yet God told me I would, and I believed him, even though the evidence of my release was not there. Then, totally out of left field, I got two, yes, two, Christian psychiatrists who believed in me. That was a miracle in itself to find two Christians in that profession in Massachusetts. The state had a lot of evidence on their side, yet the judge sided with me. Man. See, that's where you gotta draw the line. This dude's all like, yeah, God told me it was okay. I can do this. And he just, like, does this stuff. As soon as they're like, God told me to do it, you should be like, oh, we we, we should probably, like, get him away. Yeah. Like, away, away. Yeah, I mean, it's hard because when I was researching this, there's so many signs that there's a huge, huge problem. But everyone's like, ah, we can't do it. Oh, we're not going to tell the probation officer that this happened. I don't know how he keeps slipping through the cracks. I know part of it because, like, I've dealt with a few things, like, in my days being alive with, like, law enforcement. If you don't have, like, an actual proof, like, 
it's happening and you haven't caught it on video or have a voice recording or, you know, whatever, like even witnesses now, cause people can lie. So like, it's, it's really hard to actually like nail people on stuff just because of the, um, I guess the, the legal repercussions of it, the possible legal repercussions, they don't want to go all crazy, even though it's, you know, the way it is, it just, it, it, it does suck though. Yeah, for sure. Days after being released, Nathaniel saw a seven-year-old boy sitting in a parked car. He forced his way into the car and tried to smother the child by sitting on him. What is it with him and sitting on people? I hate it. I don't know. And you know that's the only reason I brought up the weight earlier. Yeah, no, I I totally get that. I just hate that, that this is a thing that he is literally like a snake and squishing the air out of someone that's just freaking awful. Oh, that was such a good way to put that, actually. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so the boy's mother showed up just in the nick of time, and he fled the scene. He was quickly arrested and claimed that he was just trying to get out of the rain. And he... What? By yeah. sitting on a child? Well, he accidentally got in the wrong car and sat on a child. Oh, okay. Yeah. He just didn't like the rain. Yeah, I'm sure that's how it went down. Yeah, I mean, you know how it is. You're having a busy day. You're just going out doing your duties, being a law-abiding citizen. You just accidentally get in somebody else's car and sit on their kid. Like, it happens hasn't it all happened the time. to everyone? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm sure it does. <laughs> <laughs> he later admitted that he was trying to kill the young boy, and he was sentenced to probation in Montana. Yes, probation. That's it. After the arrest, the Massachusetts court failed to follow up with the Montana probation officers. In fact, Nathaniel wasn't even required to register as a sex offender in Montana, even though he was on probation. Megan's law was still being debated nationally, and President Bill Clinton hadn't signed yet. It was just months away from going into effect. At this time, sex offenders were not required to register with the police. They were not part of an evaluation system, and their overall risk of reoffending wasn't being assessed. In 1993, a few days before Christmas, Nathaniel was in hot water again. An eight-year-old boy was being babysat by him, and he molested him. There wasn't much evidence, and Nathaniel, of course, denied everything. He did tell the detective that if he did do what he was accused of, he would have killed the boy. The case was eventually dropped three years later when Nathaniel's attorney filed a motion arguing that his client's right to a speedy trial was violated. In 1996, now this is when everything kind of blows up, 10-year-old Zachary Ramsey disappeared on his way to school. I just hate that it's always freaking kids. I know. That's why I hated researching this story. I'm not going to lie. It's rough. So Zachary Ramsey disappeared on his way to school. He left his apartment around 7.34 a.m. on February 6th. He walked his normal route through an alley near 4th Street. He had a blue denim jacket with green sleeves, a football jersey with his last name on the back in gold letters, stonewashed jeans, and black high-top sneakers. A family that lived in an apartment in the alley did see Zach passing through that morning. They also saw an off-white four-door car almost run the boy over. Another witness saw Zach standing in the alley as if he was maybe waiting for someone. A witness who lived at the end of the alley saw Zach looking very distressed, maybe crying, and there was a heavy set man following a few feet behind him. This was around 7.45 a.m. Nathaniel had been spotted in the alley as early as 7.15 a.m. He was wearing a navy blue police-like jacket. There were several sightings of Zach in the alley, but he disappeared somewhere between where the alley cuts into 6th Street and comes out at 7th Street. Is everyone following here? Does this make sense? 
Yes. Okay. <laughs> I also hate the term off white because anything that's not actually white is off white. Like you can't just be like it's off white and it's only sort of white. Thank you. <laughs> that's just not everything is off white if it's not pure white. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I honestly was kind of stuck on that too, not gonna lie over here. I was okay. thinking about it too. <laughs> Well, then, thank you. (laughs) When Zach didn't show up for school, his parents were contacted and they filed a missing person report, but the case went cold quickly. Zach was legally declared dead by a judge in 2011. Investigations years later show that at this time, Nathaniel did have access to his mother's, I'm not going to say it, what kind of white do you want me to say? <laughs> oh no, she has to say off white. <laughs> Choose your words wisely. His mother's car that was white but not solid, completely white, may be a different shade of white. That's right, that's off white. <laughs> God. I can't win. Um, okay, so the it was a four door nineteen seventy eight Toyota Corolla. His mother and brother were out of town for a funeral on the day that Zach went missing, and Nathaniel missed work on this day and the next few days after that as well. Oh, would you look at that? Hmm, it's starting to line up. His former roommate says that he found clothes in the apartment that matched the description of the clothing that Zach wore on the day he disappeared, and the roommate also says they found bloody gloves. Early in the investigation, there was a pretty strong lead in Zachary's case. A truck driver, who was a convicted sex offender, was talking about him to customs agents at the Montana-Canadian border. The customs agent contacted authorities right away, and the driver was detained. The FBI searched the semi and took samples of the carpet fiber and other materials from inside the vehicle. The truck driver ended up confessing to kidnapping Zachary, but it all turned out to be a lie. That always throws me off so bad when they do that. Yes. When they confess to shit they didn't actually do. Right. Like, I know they want the attention, but it's just, it's so weird to me. I know, it's so scary. The evidence that was taken from the semi was tested and did not have any link to Zach's disappearance. Also, it was discovered that the truck had been broken down and was being repaired about 150 miles from Great Falls on the morning that Zach disappeared. So he couldn't have done it. On the morning of December 13th, 1999, a police officer was driving to work and he saw Nathaniel walking a few blocks from an elementary school. He was arrested for impersonating an officer. Two days later, police went to Nathaniel's apartment and seized multiple items, including a blue police coat, a silver toy revolver, a silver badge, a Stun Master stun gun, a ball cap with the logo Security Enforcement, two disposable cameras, two albums with cutouts of children, one coat with a badge in the pocket, and numerous photos and negatives. Hannah's making a face. I was because I was like, I just, uh, it's like, you know, cops are supposed to be the people that protect you. And he's just, when people pretend to be them. It's icky. Yeah, especially when it's around kids because they don't know any better. And I just hate it. Yes. Agreed. It's it's the easiest way to commit a crime if you want to do it. Pose as somebody everybody trusts and then you just do it. People are messed up. Yeah. Police found thousands of photos of children and some newspaper clippings of Zach's disappearance. There was also a set of coded writings along with a list of 54 names that included victims from Nathaniel's previous convictions in Massachusetts and Zachary Ramsey was listed along with two children who lived in the apartment directly above him. So he's like keeping track. Oh, yeah. He's keeping track. Oh, ew. The obsessive killers are probably the scariest ones because it's almost ritualistic for them. It's like, gotta do all this stuff 
this is my thing. If I don't do it, it's not right. Mm-hmm. And who knows? Maybe, maybe part of the reason they do so many is because they're like, nah, it wasn't right. I got to do, I got to do it right. Like that, 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 that perfection, that perfectionism comes in. And that's, that's the worst place to be a perfectionist, really. That's true. Yeah, I didn't really think about that. Police say that 27 of the names on the list were children that Nathaniel grew up with. There's evidence that he traveled to Arkansas, Colorado, Florida, Massachusetts, Michigan, and Washington. Police also have evidence that he crossed the border into Can- Canada. Oh my god. You almost say Canada. <laughs> Cross the border into Canada. <laughs> wow, Megan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm new here. <laughs> Canada. Uh, so he crossed the border into Canada several times as well. This, of course, makes it really difficult, but the FBI has been working with authorities to review the missing children reports. They also found a machine that was used for autoerotic asphyxiation. I can't talk. Damn it. Of course he would be into that. Son of a bitch. I was sitting here in my head earlier just like, oh, man, like, I'm hoping this doesn't pop up. And then it popped up. And now now my brain's like, why? Yeah. And they found a human bone under the garage that belongs to an unidentified child. Like a single bone? A single bone. Oh. The FBI did look at the coded writings, and they were able to crack it. The writings detailed the torture and murder of several boys. There was something else, too. A recipe for cooking flesh. No! Oh. Did he use brown sugar? Alan, Did they have the recipe? <laughs> a meat grinder was found at the house, and it did contain human hair. Nathaniel, yes. I know. Nathaniel had several recipes written down, including little boy stew, little boy pot pie, and barbecue be some young guy. I've never hated anything more in my life. I... I know, I was, like, closing my eyes because I don't even want to see it or acknowledge that I'm saying these things. This guy's like the Martha Stewart of cannibalism. Don't bring Martha into this. <laughs> hey, she's in prison for doing illegal stuff. Screw Martha. Stop it. I like Martha now. She's awesome. She's hilarious. Her and Snoop have that awesome relationship. <laughs> They're so funny together. <laughs> Police also found a note that said, quote, Lunch is served on the patio with roasted child. I literally didn't even know what to say there. I was just sitting here looking at her with, like, my jaw on the ground. Yeah, it's horrifying. Detectives decided they should examine the sewer pipes beneath the house, but the current owner said the pipes were replaced after Nathaniel moved out because they were always getting clogged. Oh, no! Yeah, so That's icky. <laughs> nothing has been proven there, but we can have some speculations and thoughts. I definitely do. Witnesses say he often had cookouts for his mother, neighbors, and friends. Oh, no, 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 no. Tell me, no. After Zachary's disappearance, Nathaniel had people over to his house, and he served spaghetti with meat sauce, casseroles, no. meat pies, and no. charbroiled deer burgers. Oh, no. The people that attended the party did tell the police that the meat tasted strange. I hate this. I hate this so much. I hate it. <laughs> Some guests at the party asked Nathaniel what the meat was that he was serving, and he's like, oh, I just went hunting and I shot a deer. Well, police looked through Nathaniel's records and determined that he had not purchased anything significant at a grocery store for nearly a month after Zach had disappeared. Perhaps he had plenty of meat on hand and didn't need to go to the store, or it could mean something terrible. During the time frame of Zach's disappearance, Nathaniel had been working part-time in the kitchen at Malmstrom Air Force Base, and 
He was also working at Hardee's in downtown Great Falls. There hasn't been evidence to prove this, but many people believe that Nathaniel used these jobs to get rid of evidence by feeding human meat to customers. I swear to you, I am going to be thinking about this every time I get fast food now. I'm going to be freaking out. Me too. I've been very scared recently. Detectives did obtain statements from people that were close to him, and they said that Nathaniel talked about the Zachary Ramsey case pretty obsessively. He allegedly made statements that Zach's body wouldn't be found because it had been chopped up and strewn about at a variety of locations. While the city was going crazy about the cannibalism rumors, that they were hearing, Nathaniel allegedly told Zach's mother that he hunted, killed, butchered, and wrapped the meat of her son. Which, if that's true, that's the worst fucking thing I've ever heard. That is literally the worst. Yeah. I can't even fathom that. Oh my, that is awful. Mm Mm-hmm. My big gripe with this is it's kids. If you're going to be a cannibal, at least, like, make it adults. Like, really. Like, really, no. really. At least, at least make it adults. Do that not you be eat. a cannibal. Don't well, yeah, eat don't, people. Don't, don't, no. don't be a cannibal. But, you know, if you're going to... No, you're not going to. You're not. You're not going to. <laughs> no, not going to. Do not do that. <laughs> bad, bad Alan. <laughs> Detectives began working through the list of names that they found at Nathaniel's. Two of the names belonged to young boys living in the apartment right above his. The boys both had stories of being sexually abused by Nathaniel, and photos of them had also been discovered. Detectives also learned that Nathaniel was involved with Christian fellowship youth groups at a few local churches, and that's how he had access to some of his victims. Zach actually attended one of the churches, and police believe that that's maybe how the two of them met. On July 5th, 2000, Nathaniel was charged with three counts of sexual assault, one count of aggravated kidnapping, and one count of assault with a weapon. The trial had many curveballs, and lawyers accused the police of coercing statements from the children that were involved. One of the oldest boys, who was a teenager at the time of trial, acknowledged under questioning that he had gone to visit Nathaniel while he was in jail. He also admitted to writing him a letter where he basically thanked him for being a good friend. A portion of the letter was read, and it says, quote, You treated me really nice. You have never harmed me in any way. I really miss you, big guy. You were like the dad I never had. That just made me really uncomfortable. I know. I feel so bad because obviously the kid doesn't have a dad, but to look up to Nathaniel as that. Right. That's, yeah. (sighs) That's why it made me uncomfortable. Poor thing. An FBI expert testified that the boys were all telling the truth about the allegations of sexual abuse. Testimony was provided that Nathaniel placed a rope around the neck of one of the boys and hung him from the pulley in the ceiling of his kitchen, and details of erotic asphyxia were provided. That is just, I I can't, that poor kid. Yeah. Like, having to go through that and the fear that they felt, oh, that is just so sad. It's so disgusting. And I'm actually surprised by how many kids were able to give details of like, yeah, I was assaulted. Right. But I don't think they told their parents. I'm not sure. If they did, it wasn't reported. Other boys told stories about sleeping over at Nathaniel's place and he would touch them sexually, which I gotta say, parents, can we not have kids sleeping over at a grown adult's place? Yeah, for real. Nathaniel spent months talking to children and he would groom them, gain gain their trust, and then he would become friends with them. Then, of course, he would abuse them. At the trial, Numerous victims came forward, but Zach's mom refused to believe that her son was dead. Apparently, she saw a videotape of a child that she believed was her son. The video was supposedly taken at a military base in Italy, and police were able to prove 
that the boy on the videotape was not Zachary, but his mom wanted to believe that he was alive. That is even worse. Yeah. Like her having all that hope and just being like, this is him, and then finding out it's not. That is just terrible. So she visited a psychic who confirmed her beliefs. The police did present a note from Nathaniel that said, quote, Zach Ramsey, dead. But the murder charges were dropped. Zach's mother said she would testify in court that she didn't believe Nathaniel had anything to do with Zach's appearance or disappearance if she had to. She said, quote, I do not want Barjona to be convicted of a crime that I do not believe he did. He was convicted of kidnapping, aggravated assault, and sexual assault of three boys. Nathaniel received 130 years without the possibility of parole. He died on April 13, 2008, at age 51 and was never convicted of a murder. Ah! Yeah, it's such a crazy story, and I never heard about this one before. I actually never have either, and I don't know how I yeah. haven't. Because like, it should be bigger, it right? It needed to be out there for sure, but I'm going to tell you this might be one of the ones I've hated the most out of all the stories we've told so far. Yeah, I know. I hate when it has a lot of kids involved, but yeah. the and reason... Them, and, them fe- oh, and him feeding, like... To other people, yes. I know, is horrifying. Uh, but the reason I wanted to cover this one after I found it is because he was able to slip through the cracks so many times, and it's something that we need to get out there. That's also part of the reason I hate this one so much. Yeah, because I'm really sure he could have got stopped way earlier, especially after the um, after he was like evaluated and they said, uh, yes. yeah, those fantasies are crazy. You probably shouldn't be out there. I mean, people could have been saved. Yeah. So that is everything. <laughs> yeah, I really did not like this one. Yeah. And I will say, too, it was not easy to find a ton of information on this case. And there's, uh, in articles that you read, there's some debate um, as far as, like, the timeline and things that happened. So I, you know, just pulled, like usual, the stuff that makes the most sense and that I found the most information on. And you'd be like, why the heck is there not that much info? Why is this not more known? This is insane. I have no idea. It's just another way of him slipping through the damn cracks. Yeah. Cannibalism is bad. So is murdering children. Don't do either of those things. Those are some pretty valid ones. That's to perfect. Throw in there. Yes. <laughs> Like, yes, Al. <laughs> maybe if you want to not go to jail and like live a normal life, you probably shouldn't do anything that this guy did. Welcome to our advice podcast. All good <laughs> points. <laughs> but very good points. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So make sure to follow us on any of your podcast apps. Follow Send- us. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, tell us any stories that you want to hear from us. If you have a listener story, send me an email. Um, that would be at drinkingthekoolaid at yahoo.com. Make sure to put listener story in like the subject line so I can find it. Listener story! <laughs> uh, like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and go to our website, drinkingthekoolaid.com. Like us! <laughs> Give us a five-star review if you love us. Tell your friends. Tell your cats. Um, Bye. bye. bye.